Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher in the SEI Software Solutions Division. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Spring, a senior vulnerability researcher in the SEI CERT Division, and Dr. Lee Metcalf, a senior network security research analyst also with CERT. And today we're here to talk about applying scientific practice in cybersecurity research, which is actually the topic of a book that Dr. Spring and Dr. Metcalf have recently published called Using Science in Cybersecurity. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Suze. Happy to be here. And we are remote again, so we're not back in the studio yet, Um, but I do want to start off by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and how did you end up in this kind of work And Jonathan, in particular, how did you end up at the SEI doing this kind of work? Why don't we go ahead and start with Lee? So I have actually a very strange background because I have a PhD in theoretical mathematics, specializing in a field called algebraic topology. But I also spent over 10 years in industry working at various startups, doing various internet related things, and then fell into cybersecurity mainly because no one else would do it. And I ended up at CERT because I, after doing that for a while, I decided that the cybersecurity was what I really wanted to do. And I've been here for 11 years now. And it's a fascinating field with lots of different problems and I enjoy it very much. I started a journal because I thought that researchers and practitioners weren't talking enough. And that's what we do at the Software Engineering Institute is we sit at the intersection between research and practice. So, Thank you, Lee. Uh, And Jono, as you like to be known, uh, what brought you here and what is it that you like doing here? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I mean, interesting set of questions. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, I actually was interested more in philosophy and philosophy of science when I was in university. So I did a bunch of like biology, chemistry, physics, linguistics, um, that sort of stuff. Um, But I was graduating university in the middle of that housing crash that happened, and there weren't a whole lot of jobs for Mm. philosophers. Um, (laughs) And I had also done some computer science and so went into a program at Pitt for information security. Gotcha. Um, Some of my professors were uh, CERT staff that were adjuncting there, and so I ended up uh, moving another two blocks down the road once I needed a job and going to the SEI. for a long time, I've been trying to actually sort of combine the cybersecurity and philosophy of science stuff. I went and did um, a PhD, but I had to go do it in London because even though CMU has like a very strong computer science program and Pitt has a very strong philosophy of science program, those two things don't intersect a whole lot. Um, mm-hmm. So with uh, David Pym and Phyllis Iliari, I was able to find at UCL like two people who both wanted to will, willing to do some of those things. So um, I don't know how many people have done PhDs in philosophy of cybersecurity, but- You're the only one I've ever met. <laughs> so, um, and the reason for all of that is because the whole purpose of cybersecurity is to inform evidence-based policymaking, right? Whether it's organizational policy of what the security policy should be, or whether it's public policy or whatever. Um, so. I think that in order to do evidence-based policymaking, you have to understand how the evidence is gathered. And if you want to understand how evidence is gathered, you have to understand how to do science, basically. Okay, that's fair. And that's actually what we're here to talk about. So let's switch to that, um, to talking about why. And you just really introduced us to that. Uh, How would applying these methods to cybersecurity research make it a better, faster, cheaper for practitioners, users, the government, all the many stakeholders that have an equity in cybersecurity. And Jonathan, I'm guessing you may want to take that question. I mean, Lee has a lot of feelings as well. We've been working together for 10 years, so. But I mean, I, there's a you know really long history of sort of scientific methods being just 
the more reliable way to gather good evidence about how the world is working. And so if you would like to know the best guess on what's going to happen if you make a change and you can engineer a system or something, we want to understand what we know about it in, in a reliable way. And, you know, I take this sort of, uh, Dr. Pim wrote this sort of nice piece on like, if we take the cyber part of cybersecurity seriously, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was coined in sci-fi books in the 80s, Gibson sure. in Neuromancer, right? As like the overlay that we make of the social space on top of the machines. Right. And so if we take that seriously and we want to do cybersecurity, we need to secure the human social spaces that we make on top of the machines as well as the machines. And so it makes it really clear that it's this big interdisciplinary thing that's going to require a lot of communication between technical sciences, engineering sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences. And so I think that that's its own discipline. Fair enough. Lee, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I think uh, doing cybersecurity well is an important basic part of doing science and cybersecurity. And doing it well and having it repeatable actually saves time and money. So if people do it well to begin with, then moving forward, you're not repeating other people's work. You're learning from the past appropriately because it's been done in an appropriate manner. And, and that's one of the things I think that the scientific methods in general have that focus on repeatability and gathering the data and evidence that allow us to repeat an experiment, to re-verify hypothesis. So those things really, really come together in, in this area in terms of what you're saying about wanting to be able to have things that are going to save us money down the road because we know how they work. But Lee, that's one of the purposes behind the journal for digital threats research and practice, right? The DTRAP journal that you're editor-in-chief of? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the goal was to ask our authors to, for example, tell us what data source they use for their experiment. Not just say, I use malware, but this is what kind of and where the malware and where I got it from. So that someone else can come along and say, oh, that's how I do that that's how something I can repeat, or that's something I can use. Methods sitting by themselves in this field without background of what kind of data and where the data originated from aren't as useful. And, and that's one of the, again, connecting the science, that's one of the things about science in general is that we need to understand that the data is relevant to the problem, that it is relevant to the solution, and that, that it is the data that actually informs new choices that we may want to make. So that whole connection to data is a really important one in cybersecurity as well as other elements of science. So what is the current state of the practice on applying scientific methods to cybersecurity? Um, we've got the magazine that gives us sort of what are the, some of the trends. What is it that you're gathering through that source and other sources that help us to understand what's the current state of the practice in this arena? So I'm I'm also PC chair of the new security paradigms workshop this year and last year. So that I think um, is a smaller venue, but you know some more stuff like that. And let me see, like it depends really on if you mean what people are calling science in cybersecurity or what people are actually doing. So the National Academies of Science, Medicine, and Engineering, I might have got those mixed up the wrong way. About every five years, they've done a like big report on uh, what should we do for science in cybersecurity? Like what should, what should we be funding? Like what should we be prioritizing? There's certainly very high level acknowledgement that this is important. Um, but in my reading of everything that they've written down, like the NSF, the National Academies, the White House, uh, you know, GCHQ over in England, the Canadians, um, NSA, like all of that stuff. Because, you know, the NSA has the Science of Security Symposium, all of this. Um, they are still all pretty focused on a sort of like 1950s conception of the scientific method. And I say the scientific method because that's what 
is implied there, not like there are multiple methods for different disciplines that could all be used at an appropriate time in different interlapping ways. But like there was one right answer, we need to try to falsify things. And like falsification, you know, trying to prove something wrong is fine, but it doesn't tell you how to come up with a good hypothesis. It just tells you how to test one once you have it. Yes. And so a lot of what I've been interested in is describing scientific methods in a way that helps people come up with good hypotheses, you know, a more structured way of coming up with hypotheses and how you're going to test, pick what thing is the next most important thing to test rather than just saying, well, if it's falsified, if it's not falsifiable, it's no good. Give me another rock that's a different color. Well, and, and so I know as a researcher myself, that idea of coming up with a good hypothesis and understanding, I, I like both points that you made, coming up with a good hypothesis and what's the next most important thing to test as opposed to what's the easiest thing to test. Because I know that researchers do fall into the trap, partly to get funding, of, well, here's the thing that I can falsify, or here's the thing that I can test with a falsification hypothesis, so therefore that's the one I'm gonna do. The bigger question may be something that is not as amenable to that kind of approach. And we sometimes lose that because it's, it's, it's you know, perceived as not being uh, falsifiable and therefore not being testable in that way. So um, how do you overcome that? How do you deal with that? In the cybersecurity and science intersection? Yeah. Well, some of it is social among the researchers, right? And so I think that's where DTRAP is sort of well-placed. Um, other things like NSPW have been doing that on sort of maybe a different scale or a different NSPW timeline. is? The new security paradigms workshop. Paradigms there like very explicitly a Kuhn reference, right? Where mm -hmm. like Thomas Kuhn is the person, yep. philosopher of science after Popper, who sort of says, no, the falsification thing doesn't make sense, um, you know, researchers work within a paradigm where a paradigmatic example is like the example that we're working off of. And then we refine that and refine that and refine that. And then it breaks and we have a new one. And like that doesn't really happen either, but that was the, that's where uh, NSPW is coming from. Um, okay. But how do we get people to use appropriate scientific methods? I mean, you have to make it worth their effort. Sure. Um, and and part... have to give them, Answers that they can't get other ways is mm -hmm. one of the ways I would look at it. And you have to make it clear somehow when people have made a shortcut that is actually harmful. Ah, okay. Because some shortcuts maybe just save you time. And the the loss in precision or resolution maybe uh, is not harmful. So if, if somebody wants to bring that perspective into their work and they are not currently using scientific methods explicitly in their cybersecurity research, what are some steps that you would suggest that they take to bring that into their work? Uh, considerations like what are the shortcuts that are harmful versus not? Uh, how do you design good experiments, case studies? Um, you know, research strategies, et cetera, like that. What are some of the things that you would suggest to people that that agree with your perspective on, we have to go beyond falsification. Well, um, so one of the major common pitfalls we see today in science is called data dredging. It's when people have a data set and they can't prove what they're looking for. So they keep going back and refining their guess basically. Uh, and what they end up uh, doing is they're designing their experiment so that it fits the weirdnesses in their data set. Right. And data is weird. You know, every data set is weird in its own way. But if you design your research to the weirdnesses in your data set, then no one else can actually do the same thing over again. And data dredging is thought to be the reason a lot of research these days is not reproducible. Okay. And it is something that should definitely be avoided. The, the going back and saying, okay, so I didn't find it first go around, so I'm going to change things around and try again. So this is... So the interesting thing uh, about that is that one of the other things from, I'll, I'll call it classical scientific method, is, is to say, we 
define your hypothesis based on the data that you get, right? And so, so what you're saying is be cautious about that because yes. data, what we've learned about data is not all data is, is equivalent. Not all data has the same relevance to the question that we're asking. And so we not only, not only do we need to cha change and refine the hypothesis, but we need to understand what are the anomalies in the data so we're not inadvertently using anomalies as a way of focusing a refinement. Is that, is that right. fair? And it also, okay. in cybersecurity, people often see an anomaly and assume that means maliciousness. Okay, it's, ah. it's, it's called the fallacy of anomalies. It's, uh, oh, I found the weird thing in here, so therefore it must be bad. Please don't do that. Please, everyone stop doing that. Yeah. yeah so what, what so anomaly is. does not equal bad. Yeah. Right. One of the anomaly takeaways does to this not question. equal bad. Well, unless you define your security policy that everything that happens less than 2% of the time is not allowed by the security policy, in which case then, sure. <laughs> and and the other thing about data is um, in, in the internet is everyone has their own view of the internet so if I collect a certain kind of say DNS data and someone else also collects DNS data we're not going to get the same exact data set it's influenced by our location by what right. we do by, uh, by the dynamism of, of the infrastructure that we're dealing with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. By the just you know the distributed nature. It's the same with DNS. The same with routing, malware, blacklist. Jono and I showed blacklist. It's definitely true. So it, it's all in how you collect the data. So by designing an experiment for your weirdnesses of data, you're not making it you know useful for someone else. So how do you? I'm just thinking of applying this to data sets that, that I've worked with in the past, not from a security viewpoint, but just from answering other questions. How do you under, understand which anomalous, unexpected data to pay attention to for, for a refinement purpose and which to ignore? Is there any kind of a rubric to help people with that or am I getting way too deep into that? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's somewhat well, a subject matter expert thing for mm -hmm. one okay. thing. On the other okay. hand, it is a, it's a very difficult question. Um, it's why we have verification and validation. It's why you save part of your data aside and see if you can replicate it in this valid, you know, validate it. It's why we have corroboration. Right. Um, Jono and I did a report, it's 300 pages on blacklists. And that actually was corroborated soon after we released it by someone else using a completely different data set. Um, I was told he started his talk with, they're wrong, they're completely wrong, and I'm going to show they're wrong. And at the very end, he was like, no, they're right. That must have been a fun day. Um, Jono, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that you can, um, like, there are a number of different sort of desirable properties of a study, whether it's software engineering or cybersecurity or psychology or astronomy or whatever. Different fields often use different terms. Sure. But I, I think that there's sort of an umbrella around like consistency, generalizability, transparency, and containment of harms. And so like, if you have anomalies in your data set, one of the things that you're looking at is a lack of consistency, right? And there's a lot of uh, general categories of, of ways that can happen, right? You can have your study was designed in a way that was inconsistent. You can have your tool is constructed, like engineered in a way that's inconsistent, right? So like, if there's a scratch in your telescope, you're going to have consistent data collection errors, but there's like a pretty clear right. mechanism for how that happens. Yeah. And there's a way to fix it if you, if it matters, right? There's less obvious things with psychology and study design and stuff like that, that cause consistent data manipulation errors and finding artifacts like that, which are not always super obvious and might be part of the study design. So part of an inconsistency thing um, are difficult for sure. Um, but mostly requires you to go looking at, at what other people have done. Okay. And if you are designing a new tool, like studying the consistency of that tool on known systems where you know the answer is like a, just a totally different project 
than using that tool right. to go learn something new about something you don't understand. And I think one of the things we see in cybersecurity is people don't separate those things. Ah, so to me, this has an analogy to some of the techniques that we use for modeling and simulation, right? When we're looking at a simulation, we look at a known data set to validate the simulation against so that we, because we know what the answer is. We know what the actual physical space looks like, et cetera, et cetera. And we use that. So that that technique that is one that is very valid to also use in applying these methods to uh, cybersecurity and, and data analysis in particular um, is, is, is what I'm hearing from you. Um, so other things about data collection and use that come out of scientific practices and methods that cybersecurity may not, as a field, may not be paying enough attention to right now. You, you mentioned one, which is the assumption that the data I know about and the data I don't know about are, are gonna be equivalent. What are some others that, that you can think of? So my like favorite page on the whole internet is Wikipedia's list of cognitive biases. Ah, yes. So, you know, essentially that list is all of the documented ways in which human brains do not behave according to the statistical rules that you would like them to if you were doing completely rational and, and yeah. um, proper statistical inference. And for almost all of them, there are very good evolutionary reasons why your brain makes those shortcuts. Um, but also there are the 200 ways in which you're going to trick yourself when you think that you know what you're doing in a scientific study. Because So going back to that basic set of cognitive bias as, and applying it to the, the realm of cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, Lee, in some ways you brought one up, or I'm not sure if it was John or Lee that brought up the one that is any anomaly is bad, is essentially yes. a cognitive bias issue of yeah. I'm biased towards anything that is unexpected, you know, that the cause of that is is some kind of uh, malware, some kind of, of, of bad you know, event. So, so that's an example. Um, For sure. But, you, I know there are lots of other examples that, and, and uh, we'll make sure that that link is uh, the link to that page is in the um, uh, is in the in the transcript. I, I I also have a friend who has a poster of something similar in his office, and and so that's why I smiled when you brought that up. It's like, oh yeah, there's a there's a whole yeah. bunch of these yeah. that we can deal with. And you so know, that's, that's a good reminder that that this is. Uh, and I, I take your point earlier about the cyber part of this is actually, in some ways, it's the socio aspect to it. I mean, you, you could almost call cybersecurity socio security, except it's harder to say. Um, but, um, but that's really, and when you get into the social sciences, you get into a much, much bigger realm of cognitive bias and, and difficulty in uh, you know, subjective data versus objective and, and all of those kinds of things. But that, what I'm hearing from you is that distinction is important, that we're not just dealing with the technical aspects of security. And so we've got to look at that larger space from a scientific viewpoint. Well, I think, I think that there's actually, that's an interesting point, because there's actually two things that you're bringing up there. One is like behavioral economics of studying how people actually behave given all these cognitive biases, which mm -hmm. is super relevant, ah. right? Um, but even if you were studying a purely physical object, like if you're doing astronomy, right? No humans involved. You are a human. You have cognitive biases. You still need to be very careful when designing studies and analyzing results that you're not falling into these traps. And so even if we have, a, we have listeners who think like, I just study, you know, like kernel development and cryptography algorithms. Like I don't need to worry about this because I don't touch human beings. Like you are a human you still actually do need to go lead be, be aware of this so that when you design studies, you're not tricking yourself. Okay. Is that one of the functions of a journal like DTRAP where people you know, publish? I'm, I'm, I want to encourage people that have insights and that have um, viewpoints they want to get validation for. I can imagine that outside the SEI, where I know we have a lot of mechanisms for getting verification and validation in our research, but outside of that realm, you may not have very many avenues for getting that validation. Is that one of the things that 
the DTRAP has, has, has actually been able to help with? I, I think so, because we created a data, uh, excuse me, a paper type called a field note. And uh, we called the field note because it came from high energy physics. And in high energy physics, when you come up with a new particle, you don't publish an entire new paper about the new particle. There's a short paper that describes what the uh, particle is. And so a field note could be someone saying, hey, I found this new thing and this is what I tried with it. Is it working? Um, we hope to get, we, we create it for a couple reasons. We created it because we can't actually ask people from industry to write full academic papers. I've been Understood. in industry. If I had told my boss I was writing a 25 page academic paper, he'd probably still be laughing. Uh, but I could say I'm writing a shorter paper and he'd say, fine, go to it. So we created it for that. And we also created it because we want to see the new ideas. We want to see the new things that are coming out, the new particles, the new ideas. Um, and, uh, we think it's working. It's been a little rough getting going because most people want to go, oh, I'm reviewing an academic paper. And we're like, no, there's a little bit different here. It's not as in-depth of a review. Um, we also have two columns. We have one that's called with the benefit of hindsight, which we call, hey, what did we learn from past? And the other is from research to practice. And the goal from that was how do you take research and turn it into practice? And what did you learn? Gotcha. Okay, so um, we've got some mechanisms that we've talked about for thinking about uh, scientific practice and methods being applied. We're going beyond falsification as the only way that we generate hypotheses. And we are look, we've looked at some common pitfalls that we can get into, cognitive bias being my favorite. I, I, I'm with you on that one, Jono. Um, so you've written, and many of the things that we're talking about are in your book, Using Science and Cybersecurity. What's next? What's the sequel to this book? What are some of the topics either that we've talked about today or haven't talked about today that you think need to be addressed and that, that you know you, you would like to be able to cover? What, what still needs to be done in this area? Well, I'm actually working on somewhat of a sequel now with two uh, authors. And I'm so surprised to hear you say that. We are looking more at the pitfalls in cybersecurity. We're taking a closer look at, and it's not just for researchers. It's not really just for, um, you know, people at the low level of I'm trying to deal with this incident. We want everyone who has to deal with cybersecurity in some way to understand there's some, there's some fallacies in thinking. There's cognitive fallacies. There's bad assumptions that people make. Uh, there's misunderstandings about vulnerabilities and malware. And so that's uh, that's my next step. Okay. Moving forward in this. So getting a better understanding of where some of the pitfalls are, especially I'm guessing the ones that wouldn't be obvious to somebody like me who wants to be secure in the way that I act with the world but may not be as aware of some of the nuances of, of pitfalls that I may be bringing into my own practice and trying to, to you know, be a secure operator within the, uh, the areas that I'm playing in. Yes, yes. What, what, what about you, Jono? What are some topics that would be in your sequel? Yeah, so Suze, I found on page 37 a typo. I would like to fix that as I was reading about consistency to answer your last question. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a book. I'm there with you. Mine is on page 17. <laughs> no matter how many times you read it, it's almost I'll, like it's required. <laughs> I'll give a high five to whoever figures out which typo that is first and sends me an email. Um, no, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm partly involved in some stuff at first, the forum for incident response and security teams. Um, I've also been involved in an effort around ethics first, so like ethics for incident response and security sure. teams. One of the duties there that's being proposed is an ev a duty for evidence-based reasoning. So, you know, in order to, you know, sort of ethically conduct incident response and be a security team, you have to, you know, provide evidence, work from evidence, even if there's stuff that for good reason you can't share, you need to have done it in a way that's consistent with you know, reliable evidence gathering, consistency, you know, appropriate generalizability for what claims you're making. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I also am on the common vulnerability scoring system. 
SIG, awesome. so like a, a standard for how to score the technical severity of mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. We need to get these sort of um, evidence collection analysis and uh, you know just all of these basically scientific methods into our you know standard processes, right? Like right now, CVSS and I've written about this enough, right? But CVSS is not transparent in how it prioritizes things. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're gonna... So there may be contexts in which the prioritization is not as applicable if you don't know what the criteria were for setting that prioritization. Yeah, and I have good reason to believe that the criteria have some other problems, right? There was like 100 people in a room saying which things were the worst, and then someone set a curve to it, and they didn't really explain how or why they did that or whatever. Um, I think that that's just one example of one that I'm familiar with. Uh, I think there's a lot of standards which are, you know, compliance checklists without a whole lot of evidence for the efficacy of of what's on the checklist. Got it. The places that I want to go with this are um, sort of getting these sort of scientific best practices into operations. And if that's through standards or through, I don't know, what insurance companies are expecting if they're going to give you cybersecurity insurance. Mm -hmm or through, uh, you know, sort of norms of industry groups, or I guess first is not an industry group because it's a lot of nonprofits and government mm -hmm. organizations, but um, there's other industry groups that I think you could within also- Within the community uh, as a whole. Generally within the community, people actually, uh, people and understand- from what I heard you say better. earlier, you want, you're looking for these kinds of, of this evolution to occur, not just related to the technical aspects, but also to the socio-technical yeah, and, right. and helping people because the ethics that you, you brought in, in, you know, to mind the idea that there's an education process that mm -hmm. is needed for people to understand where cognitive biases related to ethics, for example, may be, you know, there may be particular types of cognitive bias that are more prevalent when you're dealing with ethics related questions than when you're dealing with purely technical uh, questions. So yeah, I guess but I think it's super hard because at some point we're talking about everyone is working from the scientific method singular that they were taught in middle school, whatever, yeah. eighth grade, seventh mm -hmm. grade, whatever, right? Maybe we need to start looking at uh, making that curriculum more nuanced so that we're, but I don't have any... Um, so you need to get into the STEM committee because I mean, that's, that's really what you're talking about is modifying the STEM curricula to be more uh, inclusive of different aspects of scientific methods. Yeah. Start them when they're young. Yep. I see that. All right. Um, anything, any topics that we didn't cover that you guys wanted to talk about today? Um, we've been around a whole bunch of different ideas and I, I, for one, been enjoying this conversation a lot. So, um, but anything that you wanted to make sure that our viewers knew about that we didn't cover? Uh, so one of my um, favorite topics in this research is that negative results are still results. Um, people hear the word negative and they want to toss it because it said negative, so therefore bad. Um, negative results are not bad results. Negative results are just, I didn't prove my hypothesis. Right. But in cybersecurity is an ever-changing field. When I started in this business, you know, what I was concerned with is completely different from what we're concerned with now. Sure. I'd never dealt with a ransomware attack when I was dealing with it. I mean, my first uh, instance of malware was dealing with something that came on a floppy. Ten inch or three and a half? Five and a quarter. Five and a quarter. Okay. I started with the tens. <laughs> <laughs> The, the negative results essentially can be used to say, hey, what your assumptions were on how cybersecurity worked five years ago are no longer valid. Right. Uh, look, no, no, no. <sighs> oh, okay. my goodness. Sorry. I, I hit the wrong topic. With this Donna. is like, I, I think I've got a solitary uh, war against the perception, yes, perception of these terms. So like... You know, I talked about moving past, you know, falsification because it's not super helpful. Mm -hmm.
the whole idea of positive and negative results requires sort of an AB uh, randomized control trial that's appropriately controlled. And that's only one kind of study. So in right. the first place, it's often getting applied to like a case study. We can't have negative results in a case study because you're not having a test really in the right way. But um, a better thing to call negative results would be unsurprising results. And so what Lee was saying was, oh, maybe you learned something that something you thought was true, like now is not true. That's not a negative result. That's maybe surprising. You might like, just because you didn't know it doesn't mean it's a, a negative result. In general, it means that like you set up some particular null hypothesis test, which is like a very specific statistical thing and you failed to reject the null hypothesis, which just means that there is no evidence that what you were testing for actually matters. Okay. But that might be surprising. Fair enough. Like, and I think Lee, to go back to what you were talking about, was the evolution of that knowledge of, I could, I, I would reframe it to say the evolution of the knowledge from what was surprising to now what is not surprising, that changes based on context. Is that fair to say? Yes. And um, with, I think with DTRAP and some of these other efforts, there's this big difference between a negative result where you've done everything very well and the result's not surprising and a non-result where you've done a crap job of designing the experiment and so you don't get any information. Okay. I do, not want, I do not want to publish non-results unless you're telling me how not to design experiments. I, I want to publish... I want to publish all of the negative results because it tells me what I don't have to repeat. Mm hmm Okay. Yes. yes. And uh, so maybe we should count it as a surprising and non-surprising. But yes, I, I want to know what I don't have to repeat. Um, and in, it's not just cybersecurity where people don't report these results. There's been studies that show that these results get hidden or people use data dredging, which I mentioned before, to basically right. go back and reframe their results so they get a, quote, positive result and they can publish because journals don't like... Um, they don't want to hear that there was no surprise here. Yes. Um, and I'm actually looking at... My term as editor in chief of the current of DTRAP ends in December with ACM. They have a term limit. Um, my next journal is entirely possible going to be on this topic. Okay. So I was going to suggest a column, a new column, things that were not surprising. Uh, no, actually, uh, <laughs> I have interest from enough people that uh, I believe I'm going to start another journal. Fair enough. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close today's podcast. I think we have a future, lots of things to talk about in the future as this work evolves. And I, I really, really appreciate this discussion because I, I am one of the things, one of the people that is much more cool and forward in terms of the way I think about science and uh, the fact that we are applying that to this very complex socio-technical set of problems. That's, that's very encouraging to me. So I want to thank both of you for this conversation and for your work and your book. And I, I want to thank you for joining us both today. Um, to our viewers, as always, we will include links in our transcripts to all the resources we mentioned, Wikipedia, DTRAP, uh, the workshops, all that stuff. Uh, you'll get uh, uh, references in the, res uh, in, the, in the transcript. And I want to thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Suze. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Jono, and thank you, Suze. You're very, very welcome. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.